Tzorayim Tovim, Erev Tov, everybody. Hope all is well. I look forward to the concluding part of this wonderful five-part series, Everyday Life in the Mishnah. Everyday Life in the Mishnah, I think, and uh, a pleasure. And truly want to thank you for all your uh, erudition and your interest and excitement as you teach over, you know, the uh, the excitement you see, Eretz Yisrael, you know, with the pictures and the, you know, bringing the Mishnayot and the Talmud to life. So, Vakasha. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. So this is the last in our series about the Tanaim. Uh, and unlike the others, we are not going to be doing you know, the historical order, the progression, but rather we're going to take kind of a, a larger view and try to get a little bit of a sense of what was life like, right? It's always very hard uh, to take ourselves out of ourselves, right? Um, go to Gula uh, or to Bar Park and you'll see uh, picture books that show Moshe Rabbeinu wearing a strimal. Because, and it's not only Hussey didn't that do this, right? It's hard to picture a world that's not our world. But in order to understand what's going on in the Mishnah, in the Gemara, in the stories and the history that we've been telling, it really does help to understand more of what their reality was. Um, now, obviously, this is a very vast topic. It's a very complicated topic. Um, anything that we talk about has to, we have to realize that we're looking at archaeology and nature of the land of Israel, whereas many of our sources, the Talmud Bavli is, you know, many of the, the rabbis are coming from Babel, which is a completely different reality, both in terms of climate and language and topography and leadership. Uh, but still, there are many things that we can try and learn through archaeology and modern scholarship that will illuminate uh, passages that are complicated for us. So what we're going to do is most of what we're going to do today is talking about um, these various issues, what we can learn about the time period through the archaeology. Um, and at the end, because we are the week before Pesach, ah, the week before Pesach, uh, we can talk a little about Pesach uh, and the Seder in the time of the Mishnah and the time of the Gemara. Okay, the picture that I brought you here uh, is if you lived 2,000 years ago and you walked down the street, chances are good you found one of these on the floor. This is a coin that is the lowest value. It is a kruta, what we would call a penny, okay? Uh, and for obvious reasons, krutot are the coins that we find the most of because who's gonna bother to pick up a penny off of the sidewalk when you drop it? So we find krutot, we find other coins as well. Now, if you learn enough Gemara, if you learn enough Mishnah, you know the different denominations of coins, you know their values, right? A kruta, a isar, a dinar, a manet, you can find charts of it in Steindals, but to actually see it, right, it is a powerful thing. Um, and the kruta is the coin of the lowest value, meaning there is a chati kruta, but for chazal, this is the, less, the least of the least. Anything that is lo shavet kruta, that is not worth at least a kruta, right? This is what you can be uh, mekadesh a woman with, right? I'm sure she'll be thrilled to get this penny in return for getting married, right? This is the least value that you can use in a business transaction. Okay, so um, we have a problem when we look at the Mishnah, when we look at the Gemara. First of all, we have no what we would call linear history. When you read the Mishnah, you read the, the Gemara, the Mishnah in particular has very little history, right? It occasionally, we'll get a story that will illuminate uh, historical moments like the story of Rabbi Yeshua and Rabban Gamliel and setting the calendar. But we have very few and far between stories in the Mishnah. We have lots of stories in the Gemara, but they mostly come right? By the way, the Gemara does not set out to tell us the stories of what happened in a linear fashion. So that is already complicated. Certain time periods like the second, late Second Temple, the Great Revolt, we have people like Josephus. Other time periods, we do not have such things. Okay, so that's one problem that we have to deal with. The other problem is the pictures that I brought you here. Which one is a kitchen, right? Common knowledge, meaning when I say to you, uh, you know, that Chazal are talking about an oven preparing for Shabbos and cooking, most of us, because by force of habit, we picture our kitchens at home, i.e. the one on the left. Very few of us, I think, picture the one on the right, okay? Because it's not what we're used to. So we don't really know what did things look like, how many people, like the most basic things, 
How many people lived in a house? Okay, we're going to talk about that. Um, what did they eat? What did their furniture look like? What did their streets look like? And so much of this is essential to understanding the laws and the stories that we come across. So archaeology can often help us in providing answers. So I put them as a few case studies, right? Case study number one, the Bar Kochba Revolt. We had a whole class on this, so I won't go into it too much. But basically, Unlike the Great Revolt, right, at the end of uh, Second Temple times, where we have a Josephus, the Bar Kokhba Revolt does not have a Josephus, okay? And we discussed this when we did the class. We don't have a linear history of the Bar Kokhba Revolt. We have a little piece here in the Gemara, and we have a little piece here in the Mishnah, and a Roman writer writes about it, and a Christian writer writes about it. But it's very unclear to the extent that we don't know the causes of the war, uh, where did it break out, who was involved, what parts of the country. So many things are missing for us. And archaeology in the last 50, 60, 70 years has started to illuminate this in an amazing way. Hey, I was just talking to Rabbi Kalman before. I'm sure a lot of people have seen the headlines this week. Uh, one of the biggest archaeological discoveries in recent decades, really, really big news, um, cave in the Judean desert that was unexplored till now, okay? uh, and they discovered, first of all, new scrolls that we could consider part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? that had not been, we don't have, haven't had new Dead Sea Scrolls in quite a long time, plus other kinds of amazing and exciting things from Second Temple times, but from much earlier as well. Okay, um, now in the in the sixties, in the early sixties, Israel did an amazing um, operation where they went into the caves in the Judean desert, which were being looted by robbers, by antiquities thieves, uh, and they started to uncover all kinds of incredible things. For example, the letters that we mentioned that talk about uh, Bar Shimon Bar, Ko, uh, Bar Kozba, right? And Shimon Nisi Yisrael. And suddenly we have written documentation of this person who seemed to have been perhaps even a, a mythical character. Not only that, we hear in literary sources about caves, right? Hideout caves. This was an important part of the story of Bar Kochba. We have them in Roman sources, and that's the source you have over here, right? To be sure, they did not try dare, dare try conclusions with the Romans in the open field, but they occupied the advantageous positions in the country and strengthened them with miles of walls, mines of walls, and order they might have places of refuge wherever they should be hard pressed and might meet together unobserved underground. And they pierced these subterranean passages from above at intervals to let in air and light. So Dio Cassius, the Roman historian, tells us about underground cave complexes. The Gemara also alludes to these cave complexes, talking about in the time of the Shemad, in the time of the decrees, they would hide out, they would fight from there, and even on a halachic level, and this is the Gemara we have here in Ketubot, of Edi Bar Avin said, that Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Ashan said, if there's a single hideaway, a machboa in the city, where the women could hide from the soldiers, it saves all the women married to priests, right? We are concerned that the Roman soldiers will come and rape the women, then the women who are married to Kohanim cannot return to their husbands. If there is a hideout cave, we assume the women went into it and they're safe, okay? Now, we knew about this from literature, but suddenly, 50, 60 years ago, we started finding these complexes. And not only do they prove to us the stories that we have in the Gemara, but they also show us where did the revolt take place? Because that's not at all clear from the sources. So we have found these complexes throughout Judea, okay? And in the north in the area of Binyamin, all the way up to Shiloh, and in the east, right, in the Judean desert. But we're also finding them in the Galilee, which we didn't know. We didn't know if the Galilee was part of the Bar Kokhba revolt, and yet we're finding these caves, okay? So that's telling us something that we did not know. And obviously the letters are even more significant. Okay, case study number two, Jewish art, okay? Uh, Professor Israel Levine uh, wrote very famously in his, uh, his monumental book about the ancient synagogue. He says, you know, 60, 70 years ago, you could say Jewish art is X, Jewish art is not Y. Today, you cannot say that, okay, because of what we are finding out there in the field. We are finding more and more things. And just because the rabbis, and this is something where we have literature is contradicted by what we're finding, right? The rabbis don't like imagery. The rabbis say don't have images of the sun, don't have images of the moon, right? Some rabbis don't like any images at all. And yet, 
when we go out in the field, what are we finding? We are finding all sorts of incredible things like, and we saw this in one of the other classes, right? Here's our synagogue in Hamatveria with the Zodiac. And here's our handsome Helios, the sun god, smack in the middle of the floor of the big Knesset, right? Uh, another synagogue that we didn't look at uh, in a little bit north above the Kineret uh, is a synagogue in a place called Korazim. I don't know if you can see this, it's a little tricky to see it, but on this stone, you have this image and you can tell she's having a bad hair day. This is Medusa, okay? Medusa from Greek mythology. Here she is in the synagogue in Chorazin. What is she doing there? She is there because somebody thought she was important enough to be there, but it's a synagogue, okay? So Jewish art cannot, you can't say this is Jewish art, this is not Jewish art, we are really finding everything. And if we thought, that there are, oh, sorry, did not erase that. Um, if we thought that only certain stories made it into the synagogue, for example, we have some of the first synagogues discovered like Beit Alpha or Tsipori have images of the story of the Akedah, right? The Binding of Isaac, that makes sense. It's a very powerful story. It's about covenant between God and the Jewish people. But the more we excavate, the more kind of unconventional stories we're finding. So these are synagogues near the near the Kinneret. Okay? One is from a place called Wadi Hamam. Uh, that's this one on the left. Uh, and one is from a place called Chukok, right next to it. Both of them have images of stories from the Book of Judges about Samson. Okay. Here's Samson fighting the Philistines. He's the big guy. Okay, here he is carrying the gates of Aza on his shoulders as he's breaking out of the city. Okay, the synagogue in um, in both of them, they're finding really extraordinary pictures, stories of um, of Jonah and the whales, stories of building the Beit Hamikdash, even a non-biblical story. Right, what we think is maybe a picture of Alexander the Greek, great meeting meeting Shimon Atzadi. So. Things that we would not necessarily have expected, and suddenly they are part of Jewish art. So archaeology, filling in the gaps or even contradicting what we know from literature. Okay, case study number three: ordinary objects, and this is perhaps the most fascinating one. Right? What did people use every day? What was part of their lifestyle? Right? Certain things we talk about and we know they exist, but we don't know what they look at look like. Other things we didn't even know they exist. So I brought you two examples here, right? The the coins on the right here, okay, these are half shekel coins of Tyrian silver. Okay, what the rabbis talk about as a, a shekel sori. The only, you have to give your tax to the Beit HaMikdash, right? You have to give it every Adar before Pesach. Every Jewish household gives their machatzit shekel, their half shekel tax. But the rabbi said, there's only certain kinds of coins that are worthwhile because some mints are good and some mints are not good. Some mints, you know, they water down their coins. So the only coins that are good are coins that come from the mint in Tyre, right, in Lebanon. And this is what they look like. And we found them in various places. One of the most intriguing discoveries was they found a whole bunch of them um, in a site called Usafia in Mount Carmel. Uh, why was there a whole bunch together? What the archaeologists think is that obviously not everybody went to the Beit HaMikdash all the time. So somebody who was coming from a town would take all the townspeople's machasid HaShekel and bring it to Jerusalem. Why didn't it make it to Jerusalem? Why did it get stuck in the Carmel region? Because maybe while he was going, he heard about the destruction of the temple. Maybe this was the year 70, right? That's the suggestion. And in despair, he just left the coins and nobody used them. Um, the, the item on the left is more prosaic, but it's actually very important, right? You may remember an important character in, uh, in Chazal whose name is Choni HaMe'agel, okay? Choni HaMe'agel was, was a very, very holy person. And when there is a drought, right, what does Choni do? He makes an igul. He makes a circle around himself and he says, God, I'm not leaving the circle until it starts to rain. And we have all these great stories about Choni HaMe'agel. Um, but a Me'agel is not only that he makes a circle around himself, it means that he is somebody whose profession is to use a ma'agela, and that's what this is, okay? We have found these stone things, the metal part, the handle is obviously modern, but the, the stone cylinder is what we have found. What is this? Okay, so here's how it works. You have a house, your house has a roof, 
okay? And roofs are often kind of a, a frame of wood with thatch, and then you would put some kind of plaster or mud on top to make it watertight. And every fall before the rain starts, you need to call the local ma'agel and have him flatten out your roof. This is a job, this is a profession. This is Kony's profession, okay? We're gonna to get to a house and what houses look like, all right? But before we get to some more examples, some of our guides in this world, there are many guides, okay? Uh, but some of the real pioneers, okay? Professor Yuda Felix, uh, among others, by the way, Haru um, Vanis and others, was uh, an expert at botany and animals. Some of you may have his books, Hatzomech Ba'achai Ba'mishnah, Right, we're going to get to the end. We're going to talk about maror. What is maror in the time of the Mishnah? What do they mean? How do we know these things? Because people started to come back to the land of Israel at the late 19th, early 20th century and start to familiarize themselves with the flora and fauna of Tanakh and of the Mishnah. Because as much as the, the commentaries throughout history knew and Rashi knew an unbelievable amount, he lived in Europe, he lived in France, he never came to the land of Israel. Okay, so for him, when he talks about Tzvi as a deer, of course he talks about it as a deer because that's what he's familiar with from his country. He doesn't know that Tzvi, the gazelle of Eretz Israel. So coming back here, um, certain people made it their Zionist mission to discover the plants and animals of the land of Israel. Okay, uh, a later uh, iteration of this, uh, is the Safrai family, uh, Father Shmuel and uh, children Ze'ev and Chana, Chana, uh, Allah Shalom, she died young. Um, and they create what is called Mishnat Eretz Israel, which is amazing, amazing work, where basically they are taking the Mishnah and looking at the realia that we know about from both uh, archaeology as well as drawings, pictures from Roman times, uh, stuff that we find in Pompeii, all different kinds of stuff to illuminate uh, what we hear about in the Mishnah, okay? Uh, another very significant um, explorer, uh, a scholar in this realm, a, uh, Noga Haruveni. We can't talk about Noga Haruveni without talking about his parents. A, Noga Haruveni was the child of Ephraim and Chana Haruveni, who were the founders of the botany department in Hebrew University, right? New Hebrew University, 1925, they come along, and they're part of these people who are exploring the idea of what does the land look like? And uh, they had a dream to create a park that would be having it all of the animals and the plants that the Tanakh and the Mishnah talk about. They did not live to see this, but their son Noga did. Uh, and he created this place out of literally nothing, right? Uh, a wilderness, a barren piece of land near Bodi'in. Today you can go to Naob to Dumim and you can see all kinds of incredible things and learn about the plants and the animals of ancient times. Uh, what they're probably most famous for, and that's why I brought you this picture, uh, is at Sukkah's time, they built all the Sukkot that are listed in the Mishnah in Sukkah, including a Sukkah on a camel. And that's what you see here. And then you walk around, hopefully with your child who has just finished learning Masachet Sukkah, and say, this is a kosher Sukkah, this is a pasal Sukkah, right? It's beautiful, it comes to life, okay? And of course, archaeologists, right? Archaeologists, so many archaeologists. I brought in Yuga El Yadin, because he's one of the most famous ones, but Ehud Netzer and Yizhar Hirschfeld, and people who brought in so many different fields, right? Ehud Netzer uh, was an, arch an architect before he became an archaeologist, and he studied Herod, and he uses his understanding of architecture to understand how Herod built. Uh, Yizar Hirschfeld went out after the Six-Day War to the old Arab villages in the southern hills of Hebron, uh, where they were still living in a very traditional way, and he asked them all kinds of questions, like, how many people live in your house? Uh, and, and he got answers that are very illuminating because the Arab family would say, how do people live in your house? Well, that depends on the season. What do you mean that depends on the season? Well, in the summertime, you know, when we're harvesting, we leave the house and everybody goes out to the field to help in the harvest and they sleep out in the field. But in the wintertime, when everybody needs to sleep, then we have, you know, we could have the entire extended family. So it could be anywhere from, you know, five to 20 people. That's a huge thing because that tells us something about what did an average house look like? What did an average town look like, right? So these are all people who are very, very useful to us. So let's start by taking a look uh, at a house. 
Okay, so this drawing is from a wonderful place up north in the Golan, and I'm sure some people have been there, and if you haven't, next time you are in Israel, you definitely should go. This is in Katsrin, okay, Katsrin, the only city in the Golan, um, and in Katsrin, they discovered, like in many, many places in the Golan, um, an ancient village with uh, an ancient synagogue, and beside excavating and, and you know, uh, reconstructing the synagogue, they did something very interesting. They created a model house. Okay, based on what we know from all kinds of archaeology and sources, right, to understand what did a house look like, what did the classic furniture look like, and it's really a wonderful place to go if you're learning about this stuff. So, first of all, this is kind of cut away, right, this whole, you know, let me make pictures again, okay, this whole area is covered, right? It's, it's with a roof, but we took out the roof so that we could understand what it looks like, okay? Um, and you have a lot of different pieces, okay? Very important, and we're going to talk about it a little later, is the chatzer, the courtyard. A lot, a lot of stuff takes place outdoors, number one, because their homes were relatively small, number two, because nobody, unless you were super wealthy, was using glass in windows, and certainly not clear glass. That technology was in its infancy, so you had kind of you know, small openings high up in the wall to let in some light and some air, but definitely not enough that you would want to spend most of your day indoors. So unless it's raining, you're outdoors. What do you have indoors? You have a small indoor kitchen, okay, for inclement weather. You have a storage room to keep all your tools. And then you have what we would call today the multi-purpose room or the great room, right, or the living room. And that's this room, okay? We're going to see that in fancy houses, this room is called the triclinium talk about that at the end when we get to the theater. This is the room where you eat. This is the room where you hang out. This is the room where most people sleep. Um, but because Jews were always concerned about sniut, about modesty, most houses, unless they were very poor, also had uh, another bedroom for the parents, right? And that's the upper story here. And pay attention to the fact that there's a ladder to get up and down. We're going to talk about that. Um, and there's also important to know about the roof. Okay, the roof is also significant. Okay, we hear a lot about the roof in our sources. The roof is flat. Okay, don't think of that triangular roof today. You know, uh, Jews came back to the land of Israel from Europe and they made nice red. Uh, triangular roof so the snow would go down like they did in Europe, but we don't have so much snow, right? In the Middle East, you have flat roofs because a roof is another part of your house and it's used for all sorts of things. You use it to dry your fruit so that you can have fruit in the wintertime. You use it for storage. You use it for sleeping on hot nights. You use it for privacy because, you know, fewer people are going up there, okay? And, and again, our Ma'agel, who is, you know, making this roof nice and plastered. Okay, one other thing, let's clear off all these drawings. Okay, um, there is no word in, uh, in the Mishnah at, for kitchen. We do not hear a word for kitchen. That's why I started off by saying, what is a kitchen? Okay, there isn't really a designated room. There's a room that has an oven. There's the courtyard that has an oven, but they don't have work surfaces unless they're very, very wealthy. Basically, what are you doing? You're squatting on the floor and dealing with your cooking. And I always, it's one of the times where I say, very happy to live in the modern world. Okay, but the mission does not recognize the concept of a designated cooking room. Okay, um, so let's get back to our second floor, our aliyah. Okay, uh, an upper bed bedroom, sometimes there's access to the roof. Um, and we have a great story here um, in Derech Eretz Rabbah about Rabbi Yoshua. Uh, a man came to his house, he fed, right, somebody unknown, a guest, he was very hospitable. He fed him and gave him the attic room to sleep in, removing the ladder, right? The guest went to bed and Rabbi Yoshua took the ladder away. In the middle of the night, the guest took the dishes and put them in his cloak. And when he tried to go down, he fell from the attic and broke his neck. Now, the man, the guest, comes with all kinds of complaints. Well, what's the matter with you? Why would you take away the ladder? And of course, the owner of the house says, well, what's the matter with you? You're stealing my stuff, right? <laughs> and you have to, and the lesson that the Medrash learns from this is that you should treat everyone with the greatest respect and with the greatest suspicion, okay? But here is our, our uh, Aliyah, right? We hear about Aliyah in other places. We have Aliyah Beit Mitzvah in Lourdes, a very famous attic room uh, where the rabbis came to a decision about uh, the uh, the three things that you have to die rather than do, right? Idolatry and uh, sexual sins and murder, right? That happens in an aliyah, an aliyat beit mitzah in Lourdes. 
um, okay, the courtyard. This is a very modern courtyard, not modern, but you know, uh, end of the 19th century uh, in the neighborhood in Jerusalem, very small neighborhood called Beit David. But I brought it for you as illustration because courtyards, certainly in the Middle East, uh, are used a great majority of the year, right? Think about Jerusalem, for example, right? Uh, Jerusalem, nine, 10 months of the year, you can really be outside a good portion of the day. We've all learned this during Corona when everything has to be outside, okay? Because the weather is mild and there aren't that many rainy days and lots of life takes place in the courtyard. And, and that's why lots of the Mishnah talks about rules for the courtyard, because realize that for most people, unless you're very wealthy, you are sharing a courtyard with your neighbors. And that's what the case is here in Beit David, and that was what the case was in, uh, in ancient times. And that's why Baba Batra has tons of rules about what is shared property in the courtyard, what is shared space in the courtyard, what are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do because you're going to disturb your neighbors, right? The rabbis are concerned about privacy, but they also understand that the courtyard has to be a very useful room, right? So you have all kinds of rules, and I just brought you, you know, one example here. Um, a man in the Mishnah Galvatra up here, a man may protest against another that opens a shop and say to him, I cannot sleep because of the noise of those that go in and out. One who makes utensils should go outside and sell them in the market. But none may protest and say to him, I cannot sleep because of the noise of the hammer or the noise of the millstones or the noise of the children. So there are limits on what you can stop people from doing. You can't have a store in the courtyard, but you can't say you can't do your work in the courtyard. You can't say you can't grind your flour in the courtyard. And you can't say you can't teach children, right? A malamed, somebody who teaches children could do it in the courtyard. So Privacy is important, but use of the courtyard is important as well. Right? And we have another source here in the Gemara, Rabbi Yochanan says in the name of Ribana, joint owners of a courtyard can stop one another from using the courtyard for any purpose, except washing clothes. Since it is not fitting that the daughters of Israel should expose themselves to the public gaze while washing clothes. So you can stop people from doing things, but you can't say girls go outside in the street and wash your clothes because that's immodest, right? So they have to be allowed to stay in the courtyard. Um, okay. Let's talk about cooking for a minute. Anybody who learned Masechet Shabbat knows that we talk a lot about cooking appliances. What are these appliances? Now, fortunately, we have found some of them and that's really very neat because it's very hard to imagine. So the Mishnah and the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat talks about a kira, right? A kira is a primitive form of a stove. And this is a kira that was actually discovered in the excavations on Masada with some cooking pots right next to it. Here's one, two, three, four cooking pots. Okay, what's the kira? Okay, the kira is essentially, it's a stone over here, a stone over here, and on the top, a third stone. And underneath is the fire. Okay, so here's our fire, and it's a very uh, primitive stove. It's a way to light a fire. Here are spaces for the pots, right? This is a double kira. We also have something called a kupach, which is a smaller version, uh, a mobile version that you can take from place to place. And this is used for cooking, just like we would use our stove today for cooking. And it's a very strong flame because it's a direct flame, okay? Um, but once you turn off the fire, the flame does not stay, okay? That is different from what we call a tanur. Now, a tanur is fascinating because a tanur um, is the same basic oven that was used literally for millennia and across the across the world, okay? In fact, if you know a little about Indian cooking, right? You know, what, are the, what is Indian cooking? What is it done? It's done in a tandoor. A tandoor is a tanur. It's the same thing, okay? What is it? It's very basic. It's very simple. It's very useful, okay? It's a clay, like a, I don't know, like a gumdrop shape, a mountain shape, okay? You have a fire on the bottom. You could have a place where you bake. And if you've ever gone, by the way, in the old neighborhoods in Jerusalem, in the, in the Arab Shuk, or even in the Bukharan Quarter, or in Machane Yehuda, you can still sometimes see these kinds of ovens where basically you take your dough and you push it up against the wall of the oven. It's actually cooked on the wall of the oven itself. Now, this is, a, a, this is how everybody made their bread, right? You could put something on top. But for Jews, a tanur had an extra advantage. Why? Because unlike the kira, where think about your stove, right? You turn off the fire and the stove is cold, right? Two minutes later, your stove is cold. You turn off your oven, 
your oven will stay hot for a while. And that's the same thing with a tanur. You let the fire die out and the oven will stay hot for a while. Why is this particularly important for Jews? Because Jews have Shabbat and we need to keep our food warm. How do you keep your food warm before there was a plata and a timer and a blech? This is how you keep your food warm. And the Mishnah and Shabbat talks about, can you use certain types of fuel even on Friday because they're so volatile that they'll actually keep burning on Shabbat, right? which you don't wanna do, but you can heat up your oven let it die down and then keep your food inside. And this was a brilliant way for Jews to have hot food on Shabbat. Now, uh, the ovens are usually in the courtyard, right? They're usually outside. And what that means is that everybody knows literally what is in your oven, right? Everybody knows your business all of the time, okay? Uh, and we have a great story in the Gemara and Tani. Uh, Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa, who was considered to be an extremely righteous man, but he was terribly, terribly poor. Um, Rabbi Hanina says he would be happy with eating a carob from one Thursday to the next, but his wife was embarrassed. And Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa's wife would heat the oven every Shabbat Eve and create a great amount of smoke to make it appear that she was baking despite the fact that there was no bread in her house, right? And there certainly is a social critique here. Why is nobody noticing this, okay, except for the bad? And here's the bad. She had a certain evil neighbor who said to herself, I know they have nothing. What then is all the smoke? And the neighbor doesn't offer to go some, give some help. She just comes to embarrass her. She went and knocked on the door to find out what was in the oven. But Bichanina Mendoza's wife is embarrassed and she ascended to an inner room, to our aliyah, our attic room. A miracle was performed for Bichanina Mendoza's wife as her neighbor saw the oven filled with bread and the kneading basin filled with dough. She said to Bichanina's wife, calling her by name, so and so, bring a shovel, your bread is burning. Right? So here's this miraculous event, but it gives us a sense of everybody is looking into literally everybody's ovens all the time. Okay? And that's the Rabbi Hanina Bendosa story. Um, other places okay, where they're richer, and we're gonna come back to this room, this triclinium, this living room, um, they did have more of a space for actual cooking. Okay, This is the Herodian Quarter in Jerusalem. These are houses of the Kohanim from the end of Second Temple times where they were very wealthy, Hey, one of the exciting things that was discovered in these houses was furniture, right? Nachman Abigad, who was the archaeologist here, said it is very exciting to discover furniture because it's not something we usually see. Now, because, as we're going to see in a few minutes, the Jews of Second Temple times were very concerned about purity. A lot of their furniture was stone because stone doesn't become impure. So we have stone tables, we have stone vessels, hey, uh, and stone lasts um, as opposed to wood, right? Which is going to disintegrate them. Um, except in very unusual uh, situations. Uh, we'll come back to furniture a little bit towards the end. We wanna talk about beds and reclining, but meanwhile, let's go outside, right? On the street, right? Um, and again, if you've learned Masachat Eruvin, right? Which talks all about public space and then what's a public space and what's a private space and where can you carry? There's incredibly intricate discussions, but what do these places look like, right? Uh, and we talk about the Rishud HaRabim, right? A Rishud HaRabim, a Rishud HaYachid, right? A public, uh, a public street, uh, a private space, and spaces in between. And the question was, was there really such a thing as a Rishud HaRabim? Right? We talk about a Rishud HaRabim as this main street that could hold 600,000 people. I could promise you there were no streets in the land of Israel that had 600 people, 600,000 people passing on them in a day. There, there just weren't. The cities were not that big, right? And there was disagreements. Rashi tells us about what does that mean, Rishud HaRabim, but we definitely do have main streets. Whether they are halachically Rishud HaRabim or not, that's a different question. But there are definitely main streets in big towns, okay? Uh, here's the, the downtown, the Cardo in Sipori, right? And I showed this to you guys when we, we talked about the Rebbe. You can see the wagon ruts, right, on the street. You can see the stores that were alongside. Um, we also have what's being excavated now, the downtown, the main street of, of Tiberia, with this uh, fancy entrance, gateways, pillars, um, and the main road, okay? Um, we hear about these streets, the Chazal, Chazal talk about uh, a stratia, okay? A stratia and a platia, okay? Strat these are words that are corruptions of, uh, of Latin words. 
Okay, stratia is a stratos, okay, or a street. That's where our word street comes from. Okay, um, and, the, and the rabbis talk about a stratia. This is the Shushu Habarabim, this main street. If you go to Jerusalem, you go to the Muslim quarter, you can see a street that's called the Lithostratos, okay, um, which is a street that Christians believe is from the time of Jesus. We know it's actually from the time of Hadrian, but it's a very interesting thing, right? A platia is a plaza, a forum, a main, you know, kind of downtown place where people would gather and go shopping. We also hear about smaller streets. Streets, mavoy, alleyway, okay? Uh, and we have a mavoy that is mifolash, that's open on both ends. We have a mavoy, she ain't no mifolash, that's like a, a dead end, right? Entrance on one end and closed at the other end. Where can you carry? We have found mavoys like this, okay? This picture on the left here is from Susia, okay? The, the town in the southern hills of Hebron, where it's a beautifully, perfectly preserved town from the time of the Gemara. And we can see these alleyways and they are lovely. They are perfect. They're exactly what uh, the mission of the Gemara are describing. We also hear about, well, let's say I have this mavoy, right? I have this alleyway and I want to carry in it. How can I carry in it on Shabbat? Uh, and, and the mission talks about something called a lechi. You have to make a sign at the entrance to the alleyway that sort of makes it into a private space. You put an extra beam at the entrance to the alleyway. And there's endless discussions about this in the Gemara, but what did it look like, okay? And if you go to Gamla in the north, you could see a lechi. Here it is, right? Here is this extra beam next to the entrance to the alleyway. It's one of the few places where we have found a lechi, but it's really, for anybody who learns these gavaras, it's a very exciting thing to see. It don't look so exciting, but it is exciting. Okay, so that's our, that's our streets, right? Our main streets in town. Um, let's move on to things that are a little bit uh, closer to us, literally, okay? Um, clothing and jewelry, right? We want to know what people look like. We hear about clothing. We hear, first of all, we hear about the fact that most people have very rudimentary clothing, right? You have your cloak, your talit. If you're really very poor, we hear about a man and a wife sharing the talit, right? And each one, whenever he or she goes out, takes the talit, okay? By the way, when we talk about a talit, don't think of a talit like we wear in shul today, but a talit is, is your clothes, right? is what you put on yourself. And it's what they put tzitzit on because it's a four-cornered garment. They don't have a talit or tzitzit like what we have today, but they do have this important garment that they wear. Why does our talit have stripes? Because important people had clothing with stripes, okay? Stripes is what the Romans, if you were an important Roman, you had stripes on your toga. If you're an important Jew, right? Rabbis have stripes on their clothing as well. Now, stripes and color, okay? Color is something that you have if you are wealthy. Only wealthy people have color. Color is very difficult to make, is very expensive. That's why kings wear purple robes. That's why the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, wears clothing with color. But in general, ordinary people like you and me, we are wearing whatever color the sheep's wool or the goat skin was. But if you're rich, you can have something that's made with color. Now, here we have an amazing discovery from one of the Bar Kokhba caves in the Judean desert from Wadi Murabat. We found pieces of fabric, okay, 1800 year old pieces of fabric. Actually, just this year, they discovered even older, 3000 year old pieces of fabric, fabric that go back to the time of Tanakh uh, in a, a site called Timna, further down near Eilat. But this was discovered in the Bar Kokhba caves. Um, this is beautiful blue, right? That's chelet, this bright blue. And, and what does it tell us? Well, first of all, it gives us, you know, it fires up your imagination because we say, wow, this is really what coding looked like, right? But it's also, um, it tells us that the people who went to hide out in these refuge caves who are part of the Bar Kokhba revolt, they're also rich people. Right? It's not just the poor people, but it's the wealthy people who are involved as well, and they're taking their fancy clothes with them. Okay? Um, we hear in the Mishnah and the Gemara about sandal. Right? A sandal literally just means a shoe, not a sandal. Okay? Um, but we also hear about something called hasna, and this is a sandal that was discovered in Masada, if I'm not mistaken. Found sandals in a few different places, something like the clothing that's hard to find because it's organic, so it's not necessarily going to last so long. We have a fascinating discussion in the Gemara and Shabbos it talks about something called a sandal misumar, a sandal with nails, and why you're not allowed to wear such a sandal on Shabbos. Gemara tells this 
story, it's kind of a strange story, about in the time of the Shmad, which we understand is the time of the Bakocha revolt, when people were hiding out in these caves, somebody's sandal got reversed and it looked like instead of coming out of the cave, it looked like somebody was coming into the cave and there was a panic, Roman soldiers are coming and they all trampled each other and they died. And that's why you're not allowed to wear a sandal in Sumar. Uh, on Shabbos, like what's the connection? It seems very strange. Uh, Professor Hanan Eshel, Zichron Bracha, wrote about this and he said, well, maybe the idea was to forbid these sandals, not necessarily because of Shabbos, right? There could be a Shabbos reason. He says sometimes Roman soldiers had sandals or boots that had nails on the bottom that actually spelled something out so that when you walked and you made footprints, your footprints would say something and that you can't do on Shabbat. He says, well, maybe there was actually a, a national reason. We don't want people to wear these. These are so associated with Roman soldiers. These are associated with persecutors. If you tell people you can't wear them on Shabbat, they'll listen. But if you don't wear them on Shabbat, you're not wearing them during the week because people had one set of shoes. Right? So by saying it's forbidden on Shabbat, basically, you're not allowing people to wear these shoes. Right? Very interesting idea. Um, and here we get to something close to the heart of, uh, I'm assuming most of the ladies here, including me, uh, and that's jewelry, right? Oh, everybody loves jewelry. Um, and one of the things that's, that's nice about jewelry is you go to the museum and you can see ancient jewelry and most of it you say, oh, I could take that home. Uh, I could wear that. Jewelry hasn't changed so much. Um, so the picture on the right, it's one of my favorite things that was discovered. This was discovered in the parking lot uh, across the street from the Ir David excavation in Jerusalem. This is a gorgeous earring that some poor lady brought with her when she came on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, she had two and she lost one and she left it behind. This is how it looked when it was taken out of the ground. It had dirt on it. Obviously they cleaned off the dirt, but they didn't polish it because gold always looks perfect, right? And it is just nice to see jewelry, but there are other things that have kind of passed from the world. Uh, Gemara and Shabbos has endless discussions, uh, the Mishnah and Shabbos and then the Gemara, about what are you allowed to, what is considered part of your clothing that you can carry on Shabbat and what is considered an accessory that you are not allowed to carry on Shabbat, right? And it's very interesting, right? Ranging from weapons to an artificial leg, right? To jewelry, okay? To something called a tzlochit shel pleiton. Now, what does this mean? Uh, the ancient world was very smelly. It did not smell nice. And if you were a refined lady, you walked around with a small little jar of perfume on a cord around your neck, right? Think of the smelling soils in Victorian novels, right? And you walk down the street, it smells yucky. You just take that little slochit and you hold it to your nose and things smell better, right? And the rabbis talk about this, but this was discovered. Here is a slochit shall play ton. It was discovered in the excavations in Migdal. Um, north of Tveria on the Kinneret. Uh, the next question is, what does the perfume smell like? And that's a very, very question. We haven't quite solved it yet. But it, somebody needs to mute themselves, please. Um, and, and, but to find such a thing really does bring alive something that has really gone from the world. This is not something that we do today. So to see it is, is really very exciting. Okay, let's talk a little about purity. Okay, um, purity is very, very, very important. It takes up a huge amount of space in the Mishnah and in the Gemara, uh, to the extent that we, we don't think about these things at all, but how, you know, in fact, most of the discussions about Nida, right, about menstruation are of, not about husband and wife having relations, I mean, that's important, but about the, the menstruating woman and is she going to make okay. things come in, right? If she is dealing with that is meant to be pure and she is impure. You hear so, an so awful so lot about it. Second temple, particular late second temple times, or they call them maybe mute everybody. Um, not me. Um, late second temple times, we have uh, almost an obsession with purity. Okay, that's the Gemara and Shabbos that you see here on the bottom. Come and see how far purity has spread in Israel. Partsatara be Israel. Um, and we see this in the artifacts, right? And this is what I mentioned before. We have a lot of stone. Stone does not become impure. And because stone does not become impure, you can use it and not have to worry that someone's going to die in your house and your vessels will all become impure. So even though it's much more difficult to make stone vessels than clay vessels and pottery, many Jews use them. And when we find these stone vessels, even if we don't have other elements that tell us this is a Jewish house, 
we assume this is a Jewish house if it's from the right time period. So for example, we found them in Jaffa, we found them in Jerusalem, in Gamla, and lots of different places. And these are pictures of them over here. But one of the very interesting ones is, okay, so you have all these very nice cups and dishes and trays. I would be happy to have them in my kitchen. But one of the, the stranger ones is this, right? And you look at it and you say, that's a bottle stopper, right? It's like a cork. Now we found the stopper, but we did not find a stone bottle that fits with it. And we think that that's because of what we have here in the Mishnah and Tarot, right? Look at the Mishnah over here. One who left an Amha Aretz in his house. And Amha Aretz is not how we use it today, an ignoramus, but an Amha Aretz in Mishnah language is somebody who's not careful about purity. One who left an Amha Aretz in his house to guard him. If he can see those that enter and leave, right? We, we don't trust this Amha Aretz with our pure food. So if you can watch him, right? Only food and liquids and uncovered earthenware are unclean. But couches and seats and earthenware that have tightly fitting covers remain clean. Meaning what? The Torah talks about something called a tzamid patil. If you have a clay jar, but it has a cover that is stone that doesn't become impure and it's tightly covered, then the jar itself can come in contact with impurity, a dead animal, a dead person, and the jar as well as the contents inside don't become impure. So you want to save a little money, you'll make the stopper out of stone, but the jar will be made out of pottery. And that, that's an ex really an interesting example of something we have in the Mishnah that we can find an example of it um, in real life. Right? Uh, another very famous example of something we have in the Mishnah I, uh, the Gemara, the Yerushalmi and Shkalim, uh, talks about uh, an interesting situation, right? I'm walking along and I walk by a, a local mikvah uh, and I see some dishes on the steps and they're half there. I can take them home. But should I assume that they have already been in the mikvah, meaning they're pure, or they have not yet been in the mikvah and they are still impure, right? And the commentaries discuss this, you know, what do we do, what does it mean, but it was only when we came back to the land of Israel that the continuation of the Gemara became clear, right? It says, depends on if they are on the way down or on the way up. The way down, they are impure. The way up, they are pure, since the way down is not the same as the way up. Very close to my house is a place called Der Ha'avot, the path of the patriarchs, this ancient route that goes up to Jerusalem. One of the, the most beautiful mikvah in the country was discovered here about 40 years ago. Okay? And as you can see, and we have other versions of this in Jerusalem as well as in other places, but this is the nicest one. Uh, as you can see, it has two openings, right? Here are steps going down. Here's the water. Here are more steps going down. Here's the water. Why would you have two openings? So whenever I come here and I ask this question, people say, well, one's for the men and one's for the women. Uh-uh. It's all open on the bottom. And uh, yeah, it doesn't work that way. But rather, one is the way down and one is the way up. Why would you do such a thing? Because anybody who has not yet gone to the mikvah can pass on his tum'ah, his impurity, to anybody else. So we want to create, in this case, a real barrier. In Jerusalem, it's more like a, a reminder of separation between the pure and the impure. Now, the rabbis are aware of this. They understand this. And they know that there is a way down and a way up. I, and when they describe this, you see this, you say, of course, that's what it means, right? But for centuries, we had to twist ourselves uh, into all kinds of, uh, you know, contorted explanations because we didn't know what this looked like. Now, whenever I do this, by the way, um, I, I always say, okay, so, you know, you go down and then you come up. Right? Uh, yes. So then somebody once said to me, well, that's because you're a righty. Right? <laughs> we don't really know which is the way down, which is the way up. Although I will say that the Torah doesn't like lefties, the Torah does like righties. Um, but that would sort of seem to indicate that the impure go down on the left, right? And come up purified on the right. I do not have an answer to this question. It is an interesting question. Um, but we do clearly see that you have a way in and a way out. Okay, and one more fascinating thing about purity and mikvah. Okay, uh, we have the, the Mishnah in Mikvaot says if you have an impure needle on the steps of a caravan, if you move the water back and forth, once a wave passes over the needle, it is pure. Okay, so you can imagine the situation. You have tiny little things. Today we have like little baskets that we take with us to the mikvah kalim. They didn't do that. Okay, um, and 
in order to make these small things pure, you would put them on the steps of the mikvah and you kind of, you know, splash a little water on them. Now, this the mikvah that was discovered not so long ago uh, in the Western Wall Tunnels, right? The Kotal Tunnels is a whole complex of mikvahot that were discovered. Most of them mikvahot that look just like mikvahot that we're used to, but this is a weird mikvah, right? Take a look at it. it it's got this tiny little opening here. You come down the steps. This is not for a person who can fit in such a thing. You have to be very, very skinny. So we think that this is actually a mikvah kalim, that you would put your needles or your cups or whatever over here and splash the water on top, right? Very interesting. Not uh, a lot discovered that look like this. Um, and and it's, a, it's a fascinating illustration uh, of this mission. Okay, uh, we will do a couple more things here. We want to have time to get to Pesach, okay? Um, the Mishnah and the Gemara are replete with examples of documents, right? Contracts, shtarot, we hear about them all over the place. How do you write a contract? How do you write a, a bill? How do you write uh, something that somebody owes you money, a star, and how do you rip it up? So to find real ones is very exciting. Okay? Uh, and again, in our Bar Kokhba caves in the Judean desert, they actually found a a bundle of documents, just like it's described in the Mishnah and Bob Metia. If you find documents in a satchel or a bag or a bundle of documents, he should return them. This is the laws of returning lost property. If it's bound together, it's not hard to find the owner. And in, in these caves, right, in the Bar Kokhba caves, the cave of letters, they actually found a bundle of documents. And obviously it had to be opened very, very, very carefully. Okay? And inside was a leather pouch. It was all wrapped up very carefully. And inside were 13 five individual documents. Okay? They all belong to one lady. You know those people who keep every electric bill since 1977? That's this lady. This is Bavta. She kept everything. Now, fortunately for us, Bavta had a very complicated life. She inherited her father's possessions. She had two different husbands. She had children from different husbands and everything about her property and what she inherited and what she passed on is in these documents. And so much of it matches with what we know about the time period of Hazal. So for example, we have the contract where her father gives her his property in his lifetime with a clause that says he can live off of the property until he dies. But Gamara talks about exactly that case. Okay, We have her ketubah where she gets one maned. Why? Because she's a divorced woman. A, a, a single woman, a woman who's never been married, gets two maned, right? She gets 200 shekels. But a divorced woman gets one maned. The Bavta was a divorced woman. So you see these, it is really very powerful. Um, and one of the examples of something that we hear about in Kazan, we really didn't know what it is until we saw it in these documents, is something called a get mikushar, right? A get is, is in this case, is not necessarily a get as in the divorce papers, but a document, okay? Um, and a get, there's a get pashut, right? A simple get and a get mikushar, a tied document. A get mikushar is better, right? It's more accepted in court. What is it? This is from Yigal Yadin's book. Take a look at the pictures on the right here, right? I write out my document, whatever it is I have to say, okay? Then I write it again on the bottom. Then what do I do? I roll up the top. Have people sign. I roll, no, actually, it's not true. I roll up the top. I sew it closed and then people sign on the outside. In this way, I can see clearly what's written in the document but it can't be tampered with because the piece inside is sewed up. And once it's opened, you know that it's been tampered with. So this is a Getin Kushar. And we found this uh, in, in the cave in Babta's archives. And it, it's really a very exciting thing. Okay, one last thing before we get to Pesach. Um, medicine, there are a lot of doctors and a lot of medical advice in the Gemara. Um, the most famous doctor in the Gemara is Shmuel, right? Uh, Robin Shmuel, Shmuel is a doctor. Um, we have a lot of good advice. Stay clean, right? Wash your hands. We have a lot of advice that today we know is bad advice, like bloodletting. And we have a lot of advice that we don't really understand. Uh, don't eat this, don't eat that. You, you want to keep this, you know, stay cold, eat hot things, right? A lot of stuff that doesn't make so much sense to us. It makes much more sense if we know about this uh, Roman doctor, most famous doctor in ancient times, whose name was Galen. And Galen lived in the second century of the Common Era. 
the Gemara, uh, the rabbis definitely know about him. And he talks about something called the four humors, right? Everybody believed that you had these different parts in your body, hot, dry, wet, cold, and the idea is that you're always supposed to be balancing them. Is this true? I don't know. Don't ask me. I'm not an expert in alternative medicine, but it's definitely what the Gemara is referring to when it's telling you it's not good to eat onions. It's better to eat garlic, right? Or the various examples that it's giving you here. Okay. In the few minutes that we have left, let's talk a little bit about Pesach. Okay. Um, so bread, what do we talk about on Pesach? It's not bread and the fact that we're not eating bread. Um, bread is a very, very basic staple uh, for us as well as for the Egyptians, but perhaps even more for the Egyptians, right? We think of bread and the Tanakh thinks of bread as food, right? Bread is often a synonym for food. Bread is even a synonym for a lifestyle. Think about Eshe Chaya, Lechem Atzlut Lo Tokal. She doesn't eat the bread of idleness, okay? But it's perhaps even more significant for the Egyptians, right? Um, because for the Egyptians, bread, number one, fuels their very large slave economy. And these are pictures of uh, Egyptian funerary temples showing, you know, the whole harvesting, grow, growing the grain, harvesting the grain, and then making it into bread. So it fuels the slave economy. You need to feed your slaves. You can't starve them. They won't work. But what's a cheap way to feed them? Bread. And we know that we've discovered these slave complexes with tons of ovens, right? And what did B'nai Israel say? Right, we remember at the Ochleinu Lechem Lasova. We always had enough bread. There was always enough bread to eat. Okay, but bread is also sacred to the Egyptians. Uh, think about the stories of Yosef. Right, Yosef will, cannot eat with his brothers because the Egyptians won't eat bread with foreigners. So bread is a very, very uh, important element in Egypt. Uh, and we have to get used to this idea. And here we talk about, you know, they they actually bury. Um, models of bakeries and of brewery, breweries with them for the afterlife, for somebody drinking beer. Okay? Um, on the one hand, being a slave is a terrible thing. On the other hand, being a slave means you never have to worry where your next meal is coming from. Um, and the nation have to break that pattern. And they have to break out of that. And they have to be able to say that we're going to rely on God, right? That's the man. We have freedom. We have choices. We're not just living this very passive, very complacent, albeit very difficult life. So that's part of the story uh, of bread. The other part of the story is the idea of a starter, right? Um, a starter, I know it's into sourdough baking, right? During the pandemic now, um, all the grains that you make bread from, right? The five basic grains, they all have gluten. So that means that everything will rise eventually by itself. But thousands of years ago, some smart or perhaps lazy baker left some dough aside and the next day he or she added it to the new dough and discovered that this made it rise really well. And this is the beginning of what we call a starter. You keep aside the old dough, you keep adding it to your new dough, you feed your starter. People kept or still do, right? Bakers in Europe, very fam old famous bakeries can keep their starters for years, for decades, for centuries, right? What are B'nai Israel commanded to do? Every Pesach, you throw away that starter. You have to have enough faith that God is going to be the one who is going to give you the, the food that you are going to need and you have to start all over again after Pesach. Okay, Maror, uh, the Mishnah and Sachim talks about five different kinds of plants uh, that could be used for Maror. The only one that we think about today, really most of us, is the chazeret, right? Or what the Gemara calls chasa, lettuce, right? It has a nice pun, chas Hashem al Israel. Hashem has mercy, has rachamim on us. But the Gemara talks about other plants, right? Uh, Olshin and tamcha, which are some kind of endiv, charchevina, which is this purple and green one over here. This is something called erigium criticum. Okay, and maror, which it seems is something called south thistle. And that's what you see here on the left. Um, and this is what the Samaritans actually use for their maror. Um, the reason we don't know about or think about these plants today is because we have lots of food. Okay? In ancient times, whatever grew and wasn't poisonous, you ate it because there just were not a lot of choices. And they went out in the field and something was growing and you ate it. So they were familiar with all these things. Uh, Gamara talks about something that all of these plants have in common. It's a very uh, nice allegorical idea. In the springtime, they are tender and soft and only slightly bitter. 
as time passes, they get harder and more bitter. And that, of course, is an allegory for our time in Egypt, where we start out in the time of Yosef, everything is nice and friendly and lovely, and then it all goes downhill. Um, Chazeret, of course, is the romaine lettuce that most of us use for the maror, but especially the Ashkenazim among us may still put on their Seder plate the chrein. And everybody has some relative who likes to eat their chrein straight for their maror. Where does this come from? This is not a plant that was known in Eretz Israel. But in Europe, they didn't know about south thistles and erigenium, right? Uh, and in the 17th century, Rav Yom Tov Lutman Heller said, oh, this, this uh, plant that the mission talked about, the tamcha, this is what we call chrein, he says, or horseradish. Um, it is not the tamcha, but it is still what people often use today, or they use both, one beside the other. Uh, and finally, right, hasaba, reclining. And this takes us back to our living rooms and our furniture that we talked about in the beginning. Okay, today, when we talk about reclining, most of us bring down our pillows from the bedroom, we put them on the back of our chairs, maybe some of us conduct some of our seder at the, uh, on the couch, but that is not what misubim means in the Gemara. Okay, what misubim means is what you are seeing in this picture and countless other pictures uh, on Greek paintings and Greek urns and Greek statues, right? Reclining at the table. Uh, Chazal based the Seder on a Greek meal called the Symposium. Okay? They take the outward form of the symposium, which is a lengthy um, evening that includes lots of drinking at regular intervals, that includes a lot of philosophy and conversation. But Chazal take this symposium, which often degenerated into very wild and often very disgusting behavior, and they fill it with the beautiful content, right, of telling the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, but this idea that you have an order to the evening, that you drink at certain intervals, and that you recline, because important people recline, that comes from the, the symposium. What are you reclining on? So here is a kleena, kleene, meaning from the, our word recline comes from this, and this is the most important piece of furniture in your house. Uh, it is a bed slash couch, Okay, usually used for both purposes. It could be very basic, it can be very fancy, but everybody has at least you know, a few of them in their house. A frame with ropes or some other kind of supports that you put cushions on, and this is what you recline on. Now, in the Greek symposium, it was only men. Okay? By the time you get to the Romans, women are also allowed to come, but only important people, only very important people. And, and this picture here is a great picture. This shows the important people who are reclining and the very unimportant person. He's so unimportant, he doesn't even get in clothes, right? He's the slave who's serving them. That's why he's much smaller. And Chazal are doing something very revolutionary. They talk about Hasaba and they say, even the servant who is serving you at the Seder, because there were servants, when he eats his matzah, when he drinks his wine, he has to recline. Even women, Right? And they say Nashim Hashuvot, important women, but Ashkenazi post at a certain point say all our women are important. Even women have to recline. For one night a year, every Jew is important. Every Jew is free. And that's what you're showing when you do Hasaba, when you recline. And this brings us back to our living room, which was called a triclinium, three places where you recline. You can actually see the nice little indentations. This is a triclinium from Tsipori, and you can see where you put your couches, okay? So that is where we recline, uh, and wine, right? We know wine making in Eretz Israel was very important, um, and we talk a lot about wine at the Seder, but our time is up, so we will leave with that uh, and see what questions we have here, okay, and comments. Let's see, going back to the top. Uh, uh, uh. My audio volume is in and out. I'm sorry. I hope that was not true for everybody. Um, caves, are there any in Samaria and Shomron? Yes. Okay. Um, locals damage archaeology all the time, mostly not for ideological reasons, mostly because they're looting, right? They're looking for stuff. And that's why this latest um, mission where they found these amazing you know, new discoveries was to preempt the looters because looters you know, find things faster than archeologists. Uh, but it, it's really not because they're you know, doing it for ideological reasons, they wanna make a buck. Um, my beloved boss, Nogar Rubaini, thank you, Paula. You worked in the Al-Kadumim, that's very cool. Uh, I don't know who Howard Smith line is, you can tell us. Um, the Sukkot are very amazing, it is true. Um, Alicia, I don't know what that refers to. Okay, what would be the floor size? Okay, that's a great question, and it depends how rich you are, right? But most people's houses were small, 
okay? If you go into the one in Katrin, really we're talking about two, two and a half rooms. These are basic houses. Rich people, of course, have much bigger and much fancier houses, okay? Uh, but really very small, and, and that's why they're spending so much time uh, outside, okay? Um, no bread, so no bracha covering the whole meal. I don't know what that refers to, so write in the comments what you're referring to, okay? Um, the cardo, right? We, we do hear, let's see, we hear about the stratia. I don't know if we hear about a cardo. I, I'm not sure we hear about a cardo. We hear about a rishut harabim. We hear about a stratia, which is the Latin word. I don't know if we hear about a cardo. I will not say absolutely not, but it does not sound familiar. Um, Okay, Rabbi Hanina Bendosa is, uh, is an interesting question. I don't think he chose not to do better. I think he was very poor. Um, okay, we have the term minal and sandal. Right, sandal, I think they really are pretty much interchangeable. Uh, I don't want to say 100%, but I think they are pretty much interchangeable. Minal just means footwear, right? Uh, but sandal is a kind of a shoe. Um, in the spring, there were no greens available. Yes, that's true, right? Uh, and how many people eat potatoes for their carpas, right? Uh, it's true, very much uh, dependent on what there was. Uh, and this is why we all need to live in Israel. Um, is it true the Mara eaten in temple times was very mild? So like I said, these plants are uh, in, the, in the early spring, which Pesach is, they were pretty mild. Right, uh, and the chasa certainly is very mild to anyone who eats it today. Um, thank you, I'm glad. Alicia was given a place to sleep in an aliyah. Thank you, that's very true, right? He was given a place to sleep in an aliyah, so we hear about it in Tanakh as well. Thank you, Debbie. Um, no bread, Rabbi Hanina Bendosa. Rabbi Hanina Bendosa, I agree, is a, is a difficult story, right? It's a difficult story. How is he living like this? How is he allowing his family to live like this? How are the other rabbis allowing him to live like this? And we have other stories like that, so I agree. It is not not a simple story. I don't have great answers for you. Um, I would like to wish everybody a beautiful Pesach. It, it is, yes, the Hayah belonged to a wealthy woman. Um, this was really a lot, a lot of fun to do this series. Um, and thank you, Rabbi Kelman and Tara and Motion. And you guys are, are great because you're so excited about everything. Hey, are there books in English which describe these topics? So hmm, English is harder. It's true. Uh, surprise on English. Felix, Felix might, some of it is translated, I believe. Um, uh, Alon, right? Alon also does write about this. He writes about history. I don't think he writes so much about this kind of stuff. Um, you heard of Felix, there might be some of it in English. Um, surprise, some of it may have been translated, but the Mishnah itself is not translated. Um, that's what comes to mind at the moment. Go out there, write a book, everybody. Um, all right, thank you. And Chag uh, Sameach. Thank you very much. Really uh, a pleasure. Like I said at the beginning, your your enthusiasm and, and passion rubs right. off and uh, really a uh, pleasure. And we look forward to learning with you more in the future. We'll, uh, you know, and uh, okay. Chag uh, Sameach. And uh, yeah. thank you. This was wonderful. Was wonderful. Thank you. We wish to see you again. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you.